My name is Tommy Sewell. I spend a lot of my time with high schoolers and young adults. Recently, I've been hearing more and more about faith deconversions and ex-evangelical coming out stories. I have this theory that part of the problem are these often overlooked, somewhat difficult questions that arise about the Christian faith. I think by avoiding these questions, we're setting ourselves up to stumble later down the road. Join me on a journey as I track down some answers. A couple months ago when I was sitting down to plan out this series, I never would have guessed I would find myself in this scenario. In the midst of some of the greatest racial division I've experienced in my lifetime, I'm flying to Tampa, Florida to meet with my friend Jay Sanders and we're going to talk about race and Christianity. We're meeting for lunch just blocks away from where the night before protesters walked the streets and police worked to control violent outbursts. Jay is the college pastor at Idlewild Church. And he and I have been friends for a long time and I feel comfortable asking him some sensitive questions. Questions that absent of our relationship could come across as insensitive or tone deaf, but we're close enough that I know Jay can hear my heart and his answers will be thoughtful and helpful. After spending some time walking around Tampa and talking about the tumultuous week our country's been through, I can tell that it's all weighing heavy on Jay. He's passionate about diversity and equal rights, and I am again reminded that Jay is the perfect person to talk to. After a brief time catching up, we drove to one of the campuses of the church that Jay works for, and I asked him these questions. Jay, does it ever bother you that the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn, really, I guess, really condemn at all, the practice of slavery? First of all, I commend you for the courage even just like to ask that question. And I think it is so important uh, for people, especially today, even as, as tense uh, as, I, as I, these kind of conversations can be, to lean into the tension because I think it is an invitation into freedom. We need to do more um, talking to each other and listening to each other. Mm. So I know the reason why you asked me that question is because we're friends. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, yeah, you know that I I know you, I love you and and, uh, and vice versa. So to get to your to the answer of that question, how do I feel about that? You know, uh, does it bother me? I would say no. I've had the opportunity to read God's word um, in its entirety from the beginning to the end. It doesn't uh, specifically say that, you know, we shouldn't molest children. Uh, but if you read God's word, it's very clear mm. that God would be against that. Um, going to the source, God's word, we recognize that God, he makes it very clear that he cares about how we treat each other. And when it comes to slavery, it is a majority group of people who have said, you know what, um, specifically with that, within history, mm -hmm. Uh, we are superior, you are not, and we're going to treat you as such. And what we see through the threads of Scripture is that God cares how we treat each other. He makes it very clear in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that we were created in His image. Um, we will never look into the eyes, I will never look into the eyes of anyone uh, who Jesus Himself doesn't love, who He didn't die for. We're created in His image. Um, so that gives me some relief. That's one reason why it doesn't frustrate me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, another reason why, is that as I look into God's word too, I mean, it makes it very clear that he makes no distinction between the inherent value of one race of, an, of, a, of ethnicity over another. It's very clear you see that throughout scripture. Um, as well as God cares about people regardless of, you, you find out in his word, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 through 19, that God cares about people regardless of their uh, ethnicity, their nationality, their social status. Uh, he doesn't elevate one over, over the other. Um, God also makes it clear in James that he, he doesn't show any favoritism. And if we try to, which is what we do if 
we believe in slavery, that it is sin. So that would be my answer. Okay. Yeah. What about, I guess there's a follow-up question that then, um, you know, a, a study in American history would show you that many of the s- early American slave owners would have also claimed to be Christians and in some cases would have really used, actually used the Bible to defend their actions. Probably the, the parts of scripture that talk about, um, because Paul talks about how to treat slaves. And I think that there's a, a big, big difference between the, who Paul was talking to and, and uh, early American slavery. I think there's, you know, it's two very different things, but still, how, how does that fit? You know, like what is that, uh, how, how can somebody practice slavery but use, try to at the same time use the Bible to defend their actions? So, I mean, I guess uh, if I take the, I can take the Bible out of this context, like scripture interprets like scripture, right? Mm. So, um, but I could also twist it if I wanted to to try to make it fit whatever I wanted it to fit and use it also to uh, justify any of my disobedience if I try hard enough. You know, it's like me saying, uh, I could first John 1 9, and God, God's going to forgive me anyway, so I can do whatever I want to do because God's going to forgive me. Is that what that means? No. Mm-hmm. I think we cheapen God's grace when we, when we uh, approach it with that heart attitude. Um, and the same thing for slave owners throughout history. And we know that they tried to use God's word, uh, I believe, twisted it. So I, I think God makes it very clear uh, in Scripture, in the context of being a slave, he wants us to be a slave to, to him. Mm. If anyone's mm. to be the master, it is to be God, the one who has uh, created us. Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate, too. Like, I extend grace um, even to those brothers or sisters, you know, uh, who maybe they were slave owners uh, or even maybe still even to this day, like, believe that. But it's a misrepresentation of the father. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were to bring you into my home, um, my mom, she raised me to, uh, you know, respect my elders, uh, to treat people the way that I wanted to be treated, uh, um, to not to steal, not to lie, you know, all of these different things. But there were also times when I was outside of my mom's home that I still had to choose to do my own thing and misrepresent it mm. to my mother. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes, um, and only God knows the heart, uh, we can misrepresent um, God by taking his word out of context. And it's so important that we uh, read it in its entirety and understand it um, from beginning to the end. And so I guess in short, you would say those slave owners, early American slave owners that were claiming to be Christians, but at the same time commit these terrible acts, you're saying they are, they're not, that's a misrepresentation. They're saying something that they are not, and that is they're not actually following the way of Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm just thinking about this as we're talking, and I, I hesitate to even say this because as a soundbite, it could come across as insensitive, but truthfully, the Bible is pro-slavery in the sense that really what you and I are called to many times in Scripture is a picture of becoming a bond servant of Christ, of Christ. A, a slave to Christ. And, and it, it even we, it sounds weird as I say that because of what we know slavery to be and the negative connotation with it. But um, I think that that's an interesting thing to point out that back to your original statement about how God doesn't value, you know, he doesn't see the social constructs that we've created. His picture to us as followers of him is, become like a slave to me, you know, that's his, that's his call. To him. Yes. 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 To, to him God. and to him yeah. alone. <laughs> to him and to him alone. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, and he has the right because he's the one who created us. Mm-hmm. What um, would you say, Jay, to uh, somebody that, that, that has read the Bible and it's, they haven't, how do I say this? The fact that they read the word slave, they see you know, Jesus talking to us and referring to how we treat him as slavery that has said, okay, well, 
maybe they're they're offended by it. Maybe they have, or they just that's like distasteful to them, and because of that, they've pushed back on the faith. You think that's legitimate, or or how would you encourage somebody to kind of get over that? Um, I would say that, as I mentioned even earlier. I know even as a person who loves Jesus, there's been times that I have misrepresented God. And we've got to extend grace to each other. The Bible talks about um, how you know, love should never fail. Um, and I, I would encourage that individual that may be out there, they may be listening, they may say, yeah, I don't want anything to do with the faith because these individuals uh, have misrepresented God. Like, first of all, identify the debt that those individual or that individual you believe owes you and then release them of that debt because mm. uh, it's going to kill you. Mm. And you're only placing your own, your, yourself in a prison. Um, and God is in your corner, uh, even in your frustration. And that's one of the things I, I appreciate about walking uh, with the Lord is that we can be honest with him and even with our, with our frustrations mm -hmm. and he can handle it. And if we give him the chance, he'll come alongside of us and will walk with us one step at a time through our, our hurts and our hangups and our, and our anger. Um, he won't force himself on you, but he, he will lean into that tension with you if you give him the chance, mm. but you have to. Mm. And if you don't, I guess my question would be, who else are you going to turn to? If not God, then who? Right. I personally do not believe that anything in this world makes any sense without God being in the picture. Mm. So if not God, who else are you going to, who else are you going to turn to? Mm -hmm. And um, I, don't, I don't think anything else will make sense without the God of the Bible in your life. And no one's going to enter into your pain and into your, uh, either your anger and all those things like the God of the Bible will. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Shifting the focus a little bit, um, what about just the idea that Christianity um, is a kind of a white Western religion? And I think maybe the root of this question, there was a time where as missionaries went out from America, they took with them, at least, I wasn't there, but from, from what I've gathered, they took with them really equally the tenets of Christianity and the tenets of, you know, the white Western civilization. And I think over time, those two things have kind of gotten confusing for people. What would you say in response to somebody who said, well, you know, Christianity is just, that's just a white Western religion. It's just a different flavor of religion, you know, that I think I would say, first of all, I think we all need to ask ourselves, as we look at the church as it is today across the landscape of America, uh, could we do better? Could we do better? Do, we, do our, our churches, our small groups, they really uh, represent um, the heart of our Father? Do they reflect the, I just say, our, our Baskin Robbins God of many flavors? Mm -hmm. Dr. King, he said, you know, 20 plus years ago that the most segregated hour in America is on a Sunday morning. And as we sit here now, you know, 20 plus, even more later, years later, I think it's still true. And, but I think we all can do better. I don't know if we can, I don't know if we can just sit on the sidelines. I can't sit on the sidelines as a black man and say, look at that, they don't have it right. Mm. Um, or vice versa. Unfortunately, um, Tommy, I, even I think a lot of times even in our churches too, maybe our, our heart intent is right. We say, man, we want multicultural churches, but I actually think what we want is multicolored ones because anytime that we push towards uh, for diversity, there's going to be adversity. Mm. There's going to be, you can expect it, there's going to be mess. And that's why most of us are comfortable, even in our churches, Surrounding ourselves on every single side with people who look like us, talk like us, think like us, 
sing the songs that we sing mm -hmm. um, when we actually are much better together. And we better get with it. We better get with it. Um, or we're going to get lost. And the reason why I say that is because if we're Bible believing Christians, the Bible makes it very clear that uh, there is coming a day when all tribes and tongue will stand before the Lord, worshiping him together. So somewhere along the way, you know, it's going to be made right. I just want to be a part of that. Mm. Mm. That, that would be my our response. So it's not inherently. So, so what you're saying is that the, this premise that Christianity and the white Western society, they're not one and the same. In fact, following Jesus is a multicultural um, movement and body. Yeah. I want to ask you uh, about that. Your wife is from Dominican Republic, right? Yes. So she's probably experienced a very, it's the same faith, but in a different culture with different pieces to it. Has that affected how you uh, think about the body of Christ, the church in a global way? Um, or have you, I guess, was there anything that, did it teach you anything by seeing how people follow Jesus in another culture? First of all, I would say, um, if you have the opportunity to step outside of your comfort zone um, and to worship with other brothers and sisters, maybe on the other side of the world who believe the God of the Bible, like, that is a really healthy thing. Mm -hmm. And I've had the opportunity, as you mentioned, my wife is from Dominican Republic, and uh, I've been in the DR with her, with, with um, our family, worshiped, you know, in a Spanish-speaking service. Uh, I don't speak fluent Spanish like my wife does, but what was sweet, though, is that the Spirit of God, it just it brought us together. Mm. I mean, the gospel transcends all barriers, all cultures, all nationalities, uh, even countries. And the only thing that rose up in me in those experiences, like being in the DR with my wife in a Spanish-speaking service, was it's it's just, it's a beautiful thing, man, when mm. we're able to bring it together, but it's hard work um, as well. Mm. What would and, you, it's and it's intentional, mm. uh, intentional work. Yeah, I, I think if we're just left to drift, we tend to drift where we're, we're comfortable, yep. right? To we, our tribes, to our echo chambers. We drift away from the diversity that really we're called to yes. in the Bible. So yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't say that more poetically. To your, you must, you must be my Angelo son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I love my uh, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question, Jay. What would you say about? Unfortunately, there's still racism present in the church today. There's still people who would not be very far removed from those southern slave owners who said, I'm a Christian, but at the same time committed terrible, um, tragic actions. That I, I think that there's still people like that in the church today. What, what would you say about that? Do, what would you say to somebody who says, well, I wouldn't be a part of Christianity because I know about so-and-so, they claim to be a Christian, but they're also a racist. So which makes them a hypocrite, I guess, you know? Yeah, yeah well, I, I think what? especially now, there's, there's people across the country who are saying, I'm not putting up with this anymore. And that could then equal them looking to somebody who's a faith leader, who, who is still allowing it, tolerating it, or actively a part of it. And so they're, they're going to, maybe even in, in an action of feeling like they're standing up for, you know, bl for black people, for any race. And they're, they're putting Christianity aside with that. Yeah, let me just say this. <clears throat> First of all, like that, that saddens me. I know that. Um, Racism definitely exists because we live in a broken world, and in a broken world, there's sin. 
and it isn't just exclusively just racism. There's all kinds of things that we could, mm. you know, talk about. We don't have time time to talk about those things, you know, right now. So that saddens me. It's not the way that God intended it to be. Um, it just concerns me if we all run to our corners by trying to take a stand. I don't know we're going to be able to make progress in our corners. Mm. I think we're, we are far better together than mm. we are far, 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 far apart. And there may be an individual uh, within the, the church body who wrestles with racism, and God can deal with them. My, my, my grandmother used to say to me, whenever I had a problem with somebody, she would say to me, God can deal with people way better than you can, so just let them do it. <laughs> Um, and they are in need of, you know, God's grace. I would also say they need to repent. But the same is true for the person that is in that same church body who gossips or who lusts or who's, you know, having an affair or whatever. Would be Um, true of you and me. Yes. Yes. It's the reason why we need God. Mm. It's left to our own devices for any of us. Uh, we are broke, busted, and disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> we need outside help. I'm convinced uh, from studying God's word and because of God's work in my own life that outside help, help is found in him. Mm. Mm. Um, we also have to understand, I think, as well, that Ephesians chapter 6 talks about um, this battle that we are up against. It's not against flesh and blood. Mm against principality. It's the the prince of the air. Let's just call his name. It's Satan who's working behind the scenes. He is laughing every time Mm. that we run, you know, to our corners or trying to take a stand. I'm not saying take a stand for like what's right or for what's wrong, but still we'll never be able to make progress in our own corners. We need each other, Mm. period. Mm. Do you ever just think about what it's going to be like in heaven someday and, uh, First of all, for all of this to be gone, mm. but then also for what uh, ce- what the celebration is going to be like. I cannot wait. Man. I, one of the things that I can't wait to do, because you know me because we're friends, like, I love to laugh. Uh-huh. So, like, I can't wait to, like, just laugh in heaven. I just wonder, like, what that's going to be like. Uh-huh. Um, but then I have to worry about, just at the end of the day, let's just call it what it is, sin, the brokenness in our world. It is also an interesting thought. I had this thought the other day, because as we look at what's going on even in our world, it just seems like, man, the world just seems to be getting a little darker and darker and darker and darker um, because of the brokenness in our world. And this thought hit me that, you know what? God is not interested in making this world better because he's going to make it new. That's right. He's going to make it new. Yeah. And we see that in, in Scripture but we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. I have a responsibility, though, to, to do my very best and my feeble efforts to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And one day, Jay Sanders will have to stand before God by myself, not alongside with the races or whatever, mm-hmm. okay, or, you know, this or that. I'm going to have to give an account for my life that also includes my response, mm-hmm. even to things here on earth. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting that you, you talk about the earth being made new, and I think what's we all, whether we're, we follow Jesus or not, I think inside of us there's this part, this, this human nature that we, we want to make the world new right now. Yeah. We're, 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 you know, like there's all this effort to do that, and I think what, what that is is that that's a desire that we have from God because he wants the world to be made new. Yep. But it's not going to happen by our, our strength. We are not going to all will the world to being new. It's going to be a work of God. And it's unfortunately, true. you know, it gets worse before it gets better. That's true. But it will get better. It will get better. And that, yeah. I, think, I think the takeaway for this is people who are experiencing that tension of, like, looking around and seeing the darkness you know, that darkness is there. The reason why we don't like the darkness is because we crave the, a new world, and that is inside of us from God. There, My there, Angelo's son, I'm there, telling man, you. There's a, <laughs> that's true. The, the, this, 
this whole tension right now is just screaming out for people to come to Christ. Yep. And I would say, because I 100% I agree with you, that I would say this, pay attention to the tension. Pay attention to the tension. Lean into it. Mm. It is an invitation into freedom. It is an invitation mm -hmm. to a better day. Maybe when Scripture talks about weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm. I don't know if we're going to see morning without leaning into that tension first and being uncomfortable. Yeah. It's going to take all of us to, to jump into it together. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. I am encouraged and challenged by my conversation with Jay. In the midst of so much conflict and division, he was willing to sit down and help me learn from the tension. I have so much more to learn and so much to do. Next episode, I drive to Orlando, Florida and sit down with my friend Miracle Matt. I need to ask him some questions about suffering.